Assalamualaikum and a very good day to everyone. You're with me again. Uh, I'm Dr. Razia Adam. Okay, you are with me for JKE 316E, Quantitative Economics. Okay, this is, uh, as I uh, already uh, mentioned earlier, that this is a level 3 course for the distance education mode at School of Distance Education USM. So we are now moving on to the second part of the syllabus. Okay, uh, part 2. For part 2 of JKE 316E Quantitative Economics, we are still using the main reference, Kelogy, uh, which is uh, produced in 2012 okay, by uh, Southwestern Sandwich Learnings. However, the slide that I'm using, okay, same as before, okay, uh, is based on Keller, but 8 edition okay, uh, produced in 2009. So all the copyright for this slide belong to Sandwich Learnings. As always, okay, you need to have with you scientific calculator okay in order for you to work with me throughout the practice okay the objective of this part is to cover for the next four or five topics okay basically we'll start with chapter five okay we we'll start with data collection and sampling and then we move on to chapter eight on continuous probability distribution and then we'll continue with chapter nine a little bit on sampling distribution and we'll uh, we'll end with chapter 10 okay on estimation before we proceed further, let's recap what we did last one, uh, last time in part 1 Okay, just to check whether you have uh, achieved the objective that we set out to do in part 1 Okay, uh, in chapter 1, okay, what we did is to discuss what statistics is all about So I discussed with you the key concept in terms of, uh, for example, the difference between what is population and what is statistic What is parameter, okay, and then we have all the other key concepts as well and then we move on to chapter 2 and 3 where we discuss graphical and tabular descriptive techniques. So we have all the different type of data in terms of nominal data, interval data, uh, ordinal data. And then we have the different type of graph. Okay, most important for you at this stage is histogram as well as ogive. And then we also have the tables, the relative frequency table and cumulative relative frequency tables. And the last part of part 1 is uh, looking at chapter 4 on numerical descriptive techniques so you learn all about uh, averages measure of location okay either in terms of me, uh, mean median or mode so i hope by now you already uh, had uh, uh, the time to look for that uh, youtube video and you know learn a little song about mean median and mode okay and then you learn about variance okay or the, you take the square of uh, S square or sigma square, then you have the standard duations. Okay, you also learn about all measure of skewedness in terms of whether it's skewed to the right or skewed to the left. Okay, uh, if we look at the objective for today's session, okay, part two, okay, in order for us to continue with uh, chapter five, data collection and sampling, and later on when we discuss continuous probability distributions, okay, your understanding from part one is very much important here. So if you don't understand what we have discussed earlier, you need to go back and make sure you understand how do we uh, measure mean and how do we measure standard deviations or variance. Because throughout the next uh, uh, few topics, our discussion will be referring to mean and standard deviation often times. Okay, let's look at chapter 5 okay, on data collection and sampling. In order to discuss chapter 5 data collection, so remember, okay, when we discuss chapter 1, okay, I already asked you the question, what is statistics all about? So remember, okay, statistics is a tool for convert, converting data into information. So you have data on one hand, raw data, you need information so that you can uh, have a better decision making. So statistics is just a tool in the middle that acts as intermediary so that from raw data, you have information. But the key questions now is, where does the data come from? Okay, how does the data is being gathered? How do we ensure that your data is accurate? Remember, your data is used to, uh, to produce information for you to make decision upon. So is the, your data reliable? Is your data representative of the population from which it was drawn? So this is the question that you are going to answer. Basically, in chapter 5, okay, you will learn about method of data collection. So, the three most popular method of data uh, collection is, number one, is what we call as direct observation. Okay, this is for uh, the social scientists mostly. For example, okay, I'll give on screen there. 
uh, for example, you are interested to know okay the number of customers okay entering a bank per hour. Let's say you you want to know that you know whether uh, there are more people okay using the bank uh, counter in the morning or is it during lunch hour or is it late in the afternoon okay so what you can do is simply stand by the door okay or stand in front of the building okay maybe it's too hot outside okay you need a shade so you just stand and observe and you know you do a tally okay oh, okay this is the first person this is second person so that is direct method of data uh, observation uh, data collection okay by direct observation Number two is what we call as experiments, okay? This is, for example, for the scientists, okay? Uh, 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 the example that I state on the screen is new way to produce things to minimize cost. Or maybe if you are a physicist, okay? You need to, uh, you need to have an ex experiment, for example, uh, if I drop uh, a ball, okay, from this height, okay, how long that, you know, it takes for the ball to, uh, to reach down? Okay, in various uh, uh, environment, for example, with no wind, okay, inside a tunnel, or is it with heavy wind outside, or is it, uh, you know, under the sun, or is it at night? So you experiment with the different uh, scenario, okay, basically what you, want, you need to know is, you know, how long it takes for the ball to drop down, okay, at a certain height. So that is uh, experiment method of collecting data. The third one is what we call as surveys. Uh, remember I discussed with you last time okay about the recent uh, United States presidential elections okay so for example uh, before the election before the actual election date like for Malaysia before our next general elections so we want to know okay who will be uh, winning the next current election is it the current governments the incumbent or is it the other party okay so in that case what you can do is have a pre-election poll okay and if you are a company okay let's say you are the marketing manager okay you want to uh, to know whether if i market this product okay is it going to be uh, successful are there going to be people who will buy this product if i package okay this product such and such way are they going to attract customers or are they going to uh, you know turn the customers away from your packaging so because of that what you can do you need to do market survey so how you do our surveys? Okay, we have three different parts. Surveys can be in terms of personal interviews. Okay, that means okay, face to face. Okay, I ask you questions, you answer. Or what do you think of um, our uh, current prime minister? Or what do you think of the packaging of this uh, product? Or what do you think of the car in the showroom? So that is personal interview, face to face. But remember, when we talk about personal interview. Um, the cost uh, involved, especially when we talk about a large sample, okay, if we are talking about only one sample, then it's okay. But if you are uh, involving more than one sample, so it involves a lot of cost, okay, in terms of time, in terms of money, okay. So one way to uh, reduce the time uh, involved in collecting data through personal interview, what you can do is simply using the phone calls, okay. So we call that telephone interview. But the thing about telephone call is that, um, uh, you miss the, 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 the element of, you know, the, the reaction of the customer perhaps by looking at the packaging, okay, you simply assume that the customer has a uh, look at your packaging, okay, you miss the uh, sarcasm, okay, that come with the customer's answer, so you need to read, okay, your customer's uh, uh, tone, okay, whether they really like the product or they don't like the product, and telephone nowadays, uh, even though it's cheaper than personal interview because you don't need to go to the person's place or house to interview them. You can interview them over the phone, but it's still expensive. So because of that, what you have is the third type of survey, which we call as self-administered questionnaire. Okay, so self-administered questionnaire, basically, you have a list of questions. Okay, usually we start the basic uh, demographic question. For example, let's say we are talking about pre-election poll. Okay, we are interested to know, okay, you will be uh, the, the rakyat, okay, the people will be voting for which party. So, you, you are interested to know whether uh, the Malays, okay, the Chinese, the Indian, okay, the other races, who will they vote for? What about the different income group or the different age group? Okay, the young generation, okay, the middle age like me and the older generations, okay. So, they have different views. So, before you start with, you know, the actual uh, questions, who you will vote for in the next coming general election. Maybe you start with, okay, are you a Malay? 
Okay, are you female or male? Are you in this age group? Okay, between uh, 21 to 30 or 31 to 40? Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, are you from KL? Okay, uh, that means uh, from which states of Malaysia? So that's another uh, things that you need to consider. And then you ask questions. What you are interested to collect data uh, in terms of, uh, for example, okay, the, uh, the voting for the next current elections. Okay, just now we discussed about uh, collecting data. I mentioned about sampling. Okay, and remember last time I already introduced to you the concept of statistical inference. Okay, what is statistical inference? Statistical inference is uh, about drawing conclusion about a population based on a sample that you have. So in this case, sampling is just a, a selection of a subset of the whole population. Okay, example, okay, uh, I hope you still remember, okay, you won't get bored with my example. Let's say the, the students of School of Decent Education in USM is 7,000 plus now. Okay, that's the current enrollment. So such that if you want to take a sample, okay, to study a subset of these students, you are not going to, to study each and every one of these 7,000 plus students. Maybe at most you select a sample of 300 or 200 or 400 okay there are reason for you to choose 300 400 200 okay you need to study that on your own but basically when you choose to select a sample of 200 out of the actual populations of uh, 7000 plus student so that is what we call sampling why you do sampling because it's cheaper in terms of cost it's less expensive to sample 1,000 television viewers than 100 million television viewers. Okay, if we are talking about those in United States, and it's more practical. For example, uh, let's say you are an engineer okay, in the uh, car manufacturing plants. Okay, you want to know whether the car that you produce, is it like, you know, it stand a certain uh, pressure at high speed okay, in, a, uh, in a crash test. So in that case, are you going to uh, uh, to perform the crash test on every automobile produced? So that is impractical. Same thing if you are producing, uh, if, if you are manufacturing uh, flat screen or telephone, okay? So you need to know, okay, because you, you, you uh, usually manufacturer, they have these things, what, they, what we call as guarantee. Okay, one year guarantee, two year guarantee and so on. So you must make sure even as simple as uh, light bulb, Okay, if you guarantee that your items or your product is, uh, it lasts for a certain period of time, so you must perform this crash test or this uh, product life uh, test, okay, to make sure that, you know, at least it lasts uh, for the period that you uh, put under warranty. In any case, the sample population and the target population should be similar to one another. So in this case, just now, back to example about student of PJJ, that is basically distance education mode student. So the population is uh, distance education mode student. So in this case, uh, if I were to take a sample, I shouldn't take a sample from the university on campus student because it's two different population. All right. So basically, that is what sampling is all about. We are still talking about the different method of data collection. Okay. Just now we discuss surveys. Okay. You can do surveys either by uh, personal interviews, okay, face to face, or phone interview, or by uh, having a, a questionnaire, okay, given to the public for them to fill up, okay. So in this case, okay, uh, you need to do something. So how you how you actually sample your population? So here we discuss the different method of sampling. Uh, I'm going to discuss with you only three, okay. There are a lot others of uh, sampling methods. But the three that we uh, need to discuss now is just first one is what we call as simple random sampling. As easy as, you know, for you taking a name from a hat. Okay, uh, same thing or we're talking about um, from using a table of random numbers or simply by throwing a dice. Okay, so that means uh, you you characterize uh, okay, your choice okay, from number one, number six and you throw a dice, okay, whatever that came out, okay. Uh, then that is your selection uh, for the sample. Okay, that's number one. And then the other example that you might think of, uh, just think of, um, you know, lucky draw. Let's say you go for a company annual dinner. Okay, you have this promise of 
Uh, okay, okay, put your coupon, okay, in this bowl, okay, and the manager perhaps or the VVIP will select, okay, the lucky one, so you get to bring home a flat screen or you get to bring home a car, luxury car, and so on and so forth. So that is simple random sampling. The next method of sampling is what we call stratified random sampling from the word strata. Okay, strata means uh, you separate the population into mutually exclusive sets or strata. So it can be in terms of age, it can be in terms of gender, it can be in terms of occupation. Uh, so remember, okay, when we discuss the different method of sampling here, you need to justify. Is it okay if I choose simple random? Okay, if it's not okay, okay, which one should I choose? Why it's not okay for me to choose a simple random sampling? For example, just now, uh, let's say, um, if you, uh, uh, you know what happened when you, uh, when you go for a lucky draw, you say, hey, why? Okay, why that person is lucky? Why I'm not lucky? And sometimes if you're talking about in a functions, okay, uh, annual dinner, for example, you might have the winner that come from one table. What about the rest of the table? There's no winner. So you feel like it's random, but you know, something is wrong. So because of that, what you need to do is, introduce uh, a, dif a different component into the sampling method so in this case perhaps you can uh, divide the draw into of you know for males okay at least male uh, those uh, uh, ho uh, those holding the coupon number that is male and then we have one that is females and then one for the kids one for the uh, senior citizen okay and other ways of making sure that the different strata actually get something so same thing when we discuss about um, uh, sampling uh, about the pre-election poll. Okay, so in this case, um, you know that if you choose simple random sampling, or if you if you uh, simply ask in the television or on the newspaper who you will vote for, so you ask that during prime time at eight o'clock news. Okay, in the evening you ask who you will vote for. Please send your SMS to this number. Okay, it, it, they charge you a certain amount for that. But is it random? Okay, bear in mind, okay, not everyone has phone. Okay, and not everyone watch and sit down at the same time at 8 o'clock to watch the news. So if you were to ask that question, okay, and people respond, and you see that, oh, this is, uh, we are talking about the, uh, the national news, so, okay, on TV3, so you know who is watching TV3, for example, and you know who is watching uh, 8 TV news, so that means your sample is no longer random. The response that you get is not representative of the whole population. So back to this uh, pre-election poll. So you need to know because nation is made up of the different group of people. So other than uh, the different race in terms of uh, Malay, Chinese, Indian, we have the different age group. We have the young generation, those who just come of age. Now only they can uh, vote, okay, and then we have those senior citizens who have been voting for so many times already, and then we have the middle age groups, okay, like me, okay, who are still not sure what uh, or who to work for, and then we have the gender, okay, and then we have the occupations, and then we have those from the rural area, area who might think differently from those in the urban area because they face different set of problems in their daily life. So that might affect their decision in terms of who they will vote for. Okay, so in that case, what you need to do instead of uh, simply ask uh, random, okay, 10 people on the street or, you know, ask people to send SMS, okay, during prime time news, what you can do is actually separate the population into this mutually exclusive set so you have um, the different state in Malaysia, okay, and then from the different state, you have um, uh, the different gender, okay, the different occupation and the different age, and you select your sample from each of these strata or this subgroup, okay? And, uh, but somehow, okay, when you do that, okay, it might increase your cost because remember, let's say now you are the, the power that be who are going to predict the... the the next uh, upper prime minister of Malaysia who will sit in power in Putrajaya. In such case, okay, you want to sample those in Sabah, those in Sarawak, those in Perlis, those in Johor, in Kelantan, everywhere, all over Malaysia, just for you to make a prediction. So that is costly. So what, what you need to do then is consider cluster sampling. So you know, for example, that the current issue about election, okay, you might have uh, urban view that is different from those in the rural, 
uh, area. So it, that means uh, what you can do in terms of cluster sampling is you sample group or cluster of elements when the population elements are widely dispersed geographically. Instead of taking a sample from the whole Malaysia, you choose one city or town, for obviously in KL. Okay, from in KL, then you can choose one housing area, one or two. And then you choose one rural area, perhaps in Sabah, in Sarawak. Okay, so you pick up one village and then you take your sample, the whole village uh, uh, folks or just now the whole uh, housing area folks and that represent your sample, urban and rural and you ask them who will they vote for. So it take into account, okay, the separation between rural and urban area. When we discuss sampling, okay, the different method of data collections, okay, and when you need to do sampling, okay, you need to bear in mind the possibility of you making sampling error, possibility of you making mistake in choosing your sample. So we divide this error into two, sampling error and non-sampling error. Okay, what's the meaning of sampling error? Sampling error is the difference between the sample and the population that exists only because of the observation that happened to be selected for the sample. So in this case, okay, back to my example about the average weight of student in PJJ. Okay, if I choose a sample of 10 students, okay, and then I get that, you know, they are mostly uh, the 10 students that first come, uh, uh, that first I come across. So it happens that they are overweight. Okay, so all 10 students that I pick as a sample, they are from the of a uh, uh, overweight side so because of that i know that oh this is uh that's not representative of the whole pjj students uh population of school of uh, education student so in that case what i can do is take another sample okay and then take more samples okay so by taking more samples instead of 10 students average weight of 10 students now i find out the average weight of 300 students of school of decent education so what happens is the average weight is more rep representative of the population. So if sampling error exists, what you can do is increase the sample size that will reduce this sampling error. But what is more serious okay, for you to know is that uh, we are discussing non-sampling error. It's more serious and this is due to mistakes made in the acquisition of data or due to the sample observation being selected improperly. So remember, when, we, when you do sampling, you must choose your sample to be representative of the population as best as possible. So there are three reasons for the, uh, uh, the occurrence of non-sampling error. It's possible that there is error in data acquisition. Okay, this can be due to incorrect measurements. Let's say you are sampling the height of students. Okay, so you, you need to use a um, metric unit or you need to have some sort of uh, equipment okay, to measure. So if you have the different uh, equipment used okay, for different sample, that might lead to incorrect measurement. Or it, maybe it's just that the person who is handling your equipment do not know how to read the measurement. So it might also lead into error in data acquisition okay, in terms of inaccurate recording of data. As simple as, you know, instead of you tick box A, now you tick box B, that is also error in data acquisition. Alright, the second type of non-sampling error is what we call as non-response error. This is the one that I mentioned just now about uh, prime time uh, evening news, okay, when you ask, okay, in the on the bottom part of the TV screen, what do you think about this issue that is uh, on the news just now? Do you agree that, you know, um uh, the uh, the 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 current uh, united states new elected president should be allowed to continue for another term okay for example united states so remember when i uh, when you do that what happened is that okay only those with phone only those who are actually sitting down and watching the news they will respond and maybe those who have who are biased against uh, Obama, for example, in that case, they don't like Obama, then they will make an effort to actually respond and send an SMS. 
What about those who are uh, basically uh, having no issues? They tend not to uh, to respond to that kind of uh, poll. Same thing if you look at the printed newspaper or online news. Okay, they also have these short uh, questions. Okay, on the right hand side or left hand side of the uh, website. Okay, where they ask simple questions. What do you think? Okay, do you agree? Okay, choose. Okay, one of these answers. That is also not correct. Okay, st uh, statistically because it might lead to non-response error. Remember, at the end of the day, people are lazy. Okay, so that is the basis of our basic assumption. So you must make sure that. Okay, everyone will respond, not just those who are not lazy. Okay, and the third type of non-sampling error is what we call as selection bias. Okay, the, that means it, uh, this, uh, this is where you exclude some members of the target population. So whatever that you do, okay, when this non-sampling error, the three type of non-sampling error happens, okay, even if you increase your sample size, okay, the error is still there, it won't be reduced. Okay. So you have to make sure when you do your sampling, you are not making uh, any of this non-sampling error. Before we move on to the next chapter, okay, uh, back in mind just now, we discussed about the different method of data collections. Okay, so we put that aside. Okay, let's now move on a little bit. Okay, we discuss okay, a little bit of chapter 7, okay, where you need to know about two types of random variables. Okay, so random variable we assign a symbol X. Okay, so in this case there are two types of random variables. Okay, it can be either discrete random variables or it can be continuous random variables. So discrete random variables, okay, takes on a countable number of values. Okay, for example, value on a roll of a dice. So you get two, three, four. Okay, uh, in this case, if you uh, throw two dice. Okay, then you get uh, 1 plus 1, you get 2, okay, 1 plus 2, you get 3, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then continuous random variables you have where the values are not discrete, the values are uncountable. When we talk about time, you are saying that time can be in terms of 1 hour, can be in terms of 30 minutes, it can be in terms of 1 day, but time can actually be specific, uh, specified in terms of is it 30.1 minute? And then is it 30.1 minute point, um, uh, and uh, how many seconds? Okay, so that is discrete, uh, uh, non-discrete uh, random variable or we call as continuous random variables. Analytically, integers are discrete while real numbers are continuous. Okay, now I'm going to introduce to you the concept of probability distributions. Don't get scared, okay, with the word probability Okay, because in this case, the probability that we are doing is much easier than the simple probability that we did last time in uh, secondary school for modern maths. Okay, so probability distribution we wrote notationally as P in bracket, capital X equal to small x, any values. Okay, so in short, we are going to write as probability of x, okay, or P in bracket, small x. What is probability distribution? Probability distribution is just a table a formula or a graph that describes the value of a random variable, I defined it just now, and the probability associated with this value. And a random variable which can be discrete, can be, discrete, uh, can be continuous, so it leads to two types of probability distribution. So we have discrete probability distribution which is discussed in chapter 7 and we have the continuous probability distribution which is discussed in chapter 8. For the purpose of our syllabus, I'm going to skip chapter 7, okay, and I'm going to move ahead straight to chapter 8 where we discuss continuous probability distribution. Next. Okay, let's look back at our objective for part 2. Okay, we are done with data collection and sampling in chapter 5. I hope by now you know the different method of data collections, how you do surveys, okay, what are the problems in, uh, in uh, doing surveys in terms of uh, non-sampling uh, error, okay, and uh, now we are going to discuss chapter 8, continuous probability distributions. Okay, now we are in chapter 8 where we are discussing continuous probability distribution. The most important probability distribution that you need to know is what we call as normal distribution. The emphasis here is the word normal, okay. 
So normal probability distribution is the most important of all probability distributions. And we have the, no, uh, the probability density function of a normal random variable is given okay, on screen. Okay, so that is the mathematical uh, formula for those who are mathematically inclined. Okay, for the rest of us okay, who are kind of scared with those mathematics, okay, enough for you to know that for normal distribution, it shapes like uh, the one, uh, the curve that is uh, shown on screen is a bell shape. Is symmetrical around the mean which is mu okay you look at the graph so you have a bell shaped curve okay the middle point is uh, the major allocation in the middle is what we call as mu so that is the shape of normal probability distributions and if you learn further in modern maths okay uh, your value okay your random variable x okay will be uh, from negative infinity to positive infinity so your bell shaped curve will never touch the horizontal axis actually it will con uh, continue to move along the horizontal axis but it will never touch when we discuss normal probability distributions this is uh, the important things for you to note okay so normal probability distribution is defined by two parameter the first one is standard deviation and the second one is the mean Okay, so remember from part one where we discussed the measure of location, mean, median, and mode. Okay, measure of dispersion in terms of variance, standard deviation. So this is where you are going to utilize what you understand from chapter one and put this into the uh, the thing that we are discussing now in chapter uh, in part two where we discuss normal probability distribution. So at this stage, if you still do not know how to calculate mean, how to calculate standard deviations. What does it mean, okay, when we discuss mean, okay, what does it mean when we discuss standard deviations? So you need to go back to part one and study the, these two uh, statistics, okay. So based on the formula on screen, so we know that normal distribution is bell shapes and is symmetrical about the mean. So it ranges from minus infinity to plus infinity. So when we discuss normal probability distribution or whatever mathematical uh, theory, you can present in terms of um, symbol and formula like shown in the middle or you can present it in terms of words okay uh, describing in word how does it shapes okay what is the value is all about or you can use graph so it's more or less mean the same thing okay normal distribution is bell shaped symmetrical about the mean the value range from minus infinity to plus infinity it will never touch the horizontal axis from whatever normal probability distribution that you have, okay, we need to have a standard normal distribution. So remember just now, I introduced to you the concept of normal distributions. Okay, so in this case, when you have a standard normal distribution, what does it mean is that you have a normal distribution, but the mean just now, okay, mu uh, equals to, is equals to zero and standard deviation sigma is equals to one. So you have this value, put it into the formula and you put it into the graph. So instead of uh, the measure of location, uh, the one in the middle, okay, instead of mu equals to whatever value, now you set mu equals to zero and you set standard duration, okay, the shape of the curve, okay, uh, the dispersion of the curve sigma is equals to one. Okay, and any normal distribution can be converted to a standard normal uh, distribution. Why do we need to do this? It's just that you need to make our life easier, okay, because this will make calculation mass uh, easier. We just use a standard normal distributions table. Before I show you the, uh, the use of standard normal distributions table, let's look at uh, the changes in uh, normal distributions. Okay, so you have the graph, okay, let's say the starting point of the graph is the, uh, the black line. Okay, you have three different bell shaped curves. Okay, so let's start with the black line. So in this case, okay, the black line is where you have mu equals to zero. I hope you know how to read graph. So remember, it's always the vertical uh, horizontal axis. Okay, in this case, uh, the height, uh, the vertical axis to show the, the length. Okay, so in this case, the middle point of the black line, okay, if you uh, just put your hands there in the middle of the bell shaped curve, the one in black. So you go down and you read the middle point is zero. So mu is zero. So if you shift the bell shaped curve, 
okay from black line to the blue line so what you have is your mu now has moved from 0 to 1 okay and when you move further from the blue line you move to the uh, the green uh, bell shaped curve your mu has further increased from 1 to mu equals to 2 so for normal distribution when you increase the mean okay that means when you increase mu this will shift up the curve to the right and the other way around if you reduce the uh, the mean mu this will shift the curve to the left you're getting smaller in value in this case nothing is mentioned about variance so remember in comics we always have this satiris paribus assumption you change one thing all other thing remain constant not uh, changing so same thing here we are discussing about the mean is changing so let's assume variance standard deviations remain the same so in this case increasing the mean mu will shift the curve to the right decreasing the mean this will shift the curve to the left okay variance or standard deviation is the same okay another part of normal distribution is when we discuss okay standard deviation just now we discuss changing the means okay in this case what happened if we change the standard deviations so here we still start with the black uh, bell shaped curve okay so in this case the black bell shaped curve okay with standard deviation sigma equals to one okay so it's still bell shaped there and then what happened if you half your standard deviation from one you cut it down into a uh, half so that's referred to the bell shaped curve in blue so you see that instead of normal bell shaped curve what you have now is a steeper uh, bell shaped curve okay with higher uh, point in the middle okay and what happened if you increase your standard deviation from one to three just now you reduce from one to half now you increase from one to three when you increase your standard deviation, okay, now we are referring to the bell-shaped curve in green. So what happened? You almost didn't see the bell shape because your graph, your, uh, your curve now become almost flatter. Okay, so in this case, okay, when you reduce your standard deviations, okay, your curve is getting uh, steeper. So that means in a way, okay, when standard deviation is small, the dispersion of your variables is small. When your standard deviation is large, the dispersion of your data is huge. So in this case, increasing the standard deviation flatten the curve and another way around, decreasing the standard deviation steepen your normal distribution's curve. Okay, Satoris Paribus mean is the same, it's just that we change your sigma, your standard deviation. I already showed to you just now, okay, what happened if we change the value of mean what happens if we change the value of uh, standard duration for normal probability distributions? Okay, and then I already told you that we need to have a standard normal probability distribution. So how do we calculate normal probabilities? Okay, so in this case, you need to convert any normal random variable, whatever that you are discussing, whatever that you are measuring, to a standard normal random variables. So let's look at your graph on the uh, left hand side okay so this is your bell shaped curves okay the one uh, on the left hand side let's say you have a bell shaped curve with a certain value of mu whatever value of mu and a certain value of standard duration sigma whatever value okay so in this case you want to make your mu whatever value just now into mu equals to zero the one uh, the graph on your uh, right hand side of the screen so in this case okay what you need to do if uh, is uh, to use the standard normal formula okay where z or z is given as x your random variable your value okay minus mu mu is your population mean and then you deduct with the standard deviations okay so in this case okay from the graph uh, on the left side of the screen mu with a certain value standard deviation with a certain value you convert those value using the same formula what you get is now the same graph okay the blue and the red curve are supposed to be the same okay in terms of their shape but it's just that now the mu okay uh, value has changed to zero and the sigma value has now become one 
So the formula that is most important for you to, to note now is Z or Z is equal to X minus mean mu divided by the standard duration sigma. In order to discuss the use of the formula just now, okay, I'm going to your example 8.2 from the textbook by Keller, the 8th edition. Okay, in this case, let's say you are the manager of a gas station. So remember the textbook is your, your American base. So gas station to them is our petrol station basically. So in this, in this case, if you are the manager of a, a petrol station or a gas station, you are interested to know about the daily demand for your petrol. Okay, so in this case, if you know that the daily demand for regular gasoline is normally distributed, that's very important, I, I, put, I put it in bold there. Eh? Okay, normally distributed with a mean of 1000 gallons and a standard duration of 100 gallons. Okay, so in this case, you are new. Okay, as a station manager, you just opened the petrol station for business and you note that there is exactly 1100 gallons of regular gasoline in storage. That means you have only 1100 gallons. Uh, petrol okay in stock and you know that the next delivery is scheduled later today at the close of business okay and just uh, try to imagine the scenario your petrol station perhaps uh, is at the one of those RR uh, in the north uh, south highway so it's very important for you to have enough uh, stock of petrol because you know that's one of the rules okay if you open a petrol station you must make sure that you know people can always come and have their petrol fill in okay so in this case as a new uh, uh, station manager you would like to know the probability that you have enough petrol to satisfy today's demand bear in mind okay when we talk about nation road okay uh, travels okay especially during the festivities uh, period like the recent Deepavali and you know the next coming year end Christmas holiday okay so if you are petrol station okay especially on the highway you must make sure that you have enough petrol and if you have only a certain amount of petrol in stock like just now 1100 gallon okay you will be wondering is it enough okay the next delivery is uh, tonight okay so you worry whether you have enough to satisfy today's demand based on the data that you gain from the information okay that is given just now okay in example 8.2 okay you know that the demand is normally distributed okay this is the assumptions okay in order for you to use the formula so if you do not have the word normally distributed then you cannot use the z formula so in this case when demand is normally distributed with mean mu equals to thousand and standard duration sigma equals to hundred your question now is to find probability that you know you have enough petrol that means the demand for today is less than 1100 gallon so we write that as probability x okay x is the ver random variable of interest in this case is we're talking about uh, enough demand uh, enough uh, demand for petrol okay and it should be less than the stock that you have which is 1100 so you write that mathematically probability p in bracket x is less than 1100 you must be able to interpret okay the sentence okay in order for you to write it mathematically so graphically then you can uh, draw or sketch this graph this bell shaped curve so you put mu okay in the middle there mu equals to thousand and you have your stock your stock now is 1100 definitely more than the mean demand but you know you still wonder what if there are demand more than 1100 so what's probability of that happening okay so that's what we are going to find out we are still discussing example 8.2 Okay, the first step now, if you have the information already pulled out, okay, as um, shown earlier, okay, the first step is for you to standardize the X value, okay. So, in this case, okay, if uh, you perform any operation on X, you must perform the same operation on uh, your value of 1100. That's what you have, okay, you look at on the left-hand side of the screen, probability of X less than 1100 okay so in this case you change x into z okay by using the formula x minus mean divided by standard duration okay uh, the one that i highlight in blue background 
So in this case, probability of X become probability of Z, standard value now, and 1,100 also need to go through the same transformation. So you take 1,100, you minus with the mean value of 1,000, you divide with the standard deviation of 100. Okay, 1,100 minus 1,000, you have 100. 100 divided by 100, you have 1. So probability of X less than 1,100 now become probability of Z less than 1. So this is standard value which you can read from a table. If you look at uh, example 8.2, the figure below graphically depicts the probability that we see. So it's the same ground, the same bell-shaped curve, it's just that instead of talking about X and your mean 1,100, and your current stock of one, uh, your mean of 1000 and your current stock of 1100 now you change the value in term of z so it's the same shape okay the shaded area remain the same but your mean now okay equals to 0 and then you have your 1100 become 1 in example 8.2 the value of z specified the location of the corresponding value of x so in this case, a value of z equals to 1 corresponds to a value of x that is 1 standard deviation above the means. So you notice as well that the mean of z, which is 0, corresponds to the mean of x previously 1000 uh, units. This is where you need to look at your textbook. Okay, In this case, you need to refer to table 3 in appendix B which uh, show to you what a standard normal probability table looks like. Okay, the standard normal probability table leaves cumul cumulative probability of P, Z, okay, less than a certain value of Z. Okay, that means whatever value that we are talking about. For value of Z ranging from negative 3.09 to positive 3.09. Okay, before we go further and discuss example 8.2 uh, in terms of, you know, the, the things that we want, perhaps we can learn about how to read table. Okay, how to read table normal distribution. So, this is the first part. Suppose that we want to determine the following probability. Okay, put aside example 8.2. Let's concentrate on what we have here. So, we want to know what is the probability of Z less than negative 1.52 if you look at the table in, uh, at, uh, in the textbook appendix b table 3 first what you need to do is find negative 1.5 in the left margin okay and then the second step is for you to move along this row until you find the probability under the uh, 0 0.02 heading okay that is the column heading so then you can read okay the value for probability of z less than 1.52 is equals to 0 0.0643. So that is your answer. Probability of z less than 1.52 is equals to 0 0.0643. Bear in mind, when we discuss probability, probability has to be between 0 and 1. You cannot have negative, you cannot have more than 1. This is how we show okay, the values that you are looking for just now in table 3. So in this case, probability of Z less than 91.52 is shown as the area to the left of the negative 1.52, that point. If you look at the graph, okay, you have mu equals to 0 in the middle. So negative must be to the left of Z, uh, mu. So negative 1.52 is somewhere there. So area less than shows that you know, it's the tail area, the left-hand side tail because it's Z less than 91.52. Okay, so in this case, okay, by right, you already estimate, oh, probability should be less than 0 0.5. It should be very small because this is the tail area. So you read from the table just now, you get the probability of Z less than negative 1.52, you get 0 0.0643. That means uh, about point, uh, about 1% or 0.6% uh, more than 5% uh, values. Okay, now I'm going to, uh, to going to share with you how do we read table 3 still on normal uh, probability distribution, the standard one. Okay, this is another way of reading table 3. So in this case, to determine the probability that the standard normal random variable is greater than some value of z. How you are going to do that? So in this case, 
find uh, the example given find the probability that z is greater than 1.8 by determining the probability that z is less than 1.8 then subtract the value from 1 so this is where we are actually applying the complement rule okay so bear in mind the whole area under the bell shaped curve is your probability and you know that probability equals to 1 that means the whole area under the curve if you shade it Okay, it represent the whole probability equals to 1. So in this case, if you are interested to find probability of Z greater than 1.8 positive, okay, what you need to do is, you know the whole area under the curve is uh, 1, and then you need to find what is the uh, value for probability of Z less than 1.8. So this is the, the left-hand side of the, uh, the shaded area. I'm going to show you the graph after this so in this case if you read from the normal table for z equals to 1.8 the area to the left okay z less than 1.8 is equals to 0 0.9641 okay so 1 minus 0 0.9641 you get the answer 0 0.0359 so i'm going to show you the graph now okay so this is what i mentioned just now so your question is actually to find what is the value of probability of z greater than 1.8. So if you do the sketch, okay, so mean, okay, uh, the mean of your uh, standard normal distribution is equal to zero right in the middle there. And then you have 1.8 is somewhere to the right of your screen, okay. So 1.8. And then you, you, are, you are interested to find probability Z greater than. So the symbol greater than, it tells you that, oh, I should uh, uh, sketch the area to the right of 1.8. So you, you sketch in, okay, in red, okay, the area of uh, greater than 1.8. But the normal table, okay, uh, in uh, table 3 in the appendix B, always read the area to the left of 1.8 isn't it okay so in this case we need to use the complementary rules the whole area under the curve is one okay you you want the area the tail on the right hand side of the screen now what you need to do is find the area to the left hand side of 1.8 so you read from the table the area to the uh, left of uh, hand side of 1.8 is 0 0.9641 so that is a big area, okay, 0 0.96. So you the whole at probability 1 minus 0 0.96, you get probability of 0 0.03. The tail area is very small. So you must use your logic as well. The tail, okay, probability is very small. You shouldn't get more than 0 0.5. This is another way for you to read table 3, okay, uh, in terms of standard normal distributions. Okay, this is uh, for you to determine the probability that a standard normal random variable lies between two values of z. Let's say the question is asking you to find the probability between uh, z between negative 1.3 and z is also less than 2.1. So you are given a range of value, the maximum 2.1 and the minimum negative 1.3. So in this case, what you need to do is find the two cumulative probability and calculate their difference. So in this case, okay, remember table 3 in the appendix B, they always read area to the left of whatever Z value. So in this case, first you need to find, okay, what's the probability of Z less than negative 1.3? Okay, from the tables, you get the value is 0.0968. And then the next part is where you need to find out what's the probability of Z less than 2.1. You get from the table, the area under the curve or the probability is given as 0.9821. So in this case, if we are talking about Z between negative 1.3 and 2.1, the probability is given as probability of Z less than 2.1 deduct with the probability of z less than negative 1.3 so you get 0 0.98 deduct with 0 0.09 so you get the area under the curve the shaded area 
uh, equals to 0.8853. So this is your answer. This is mathematically uh, shown on screen, but now I'm going to show you the graph so that you understand why. Okay, when we calculate the probability of z between 2.1 and negative 1.3, why do we do we do it like what we did just now? Okay, we are still looking at table 3. Okay, in this case, you are interested to find out the probability of Z lies in between 2.1 and negative 1.3. Okay, so as I told you earlier, okay, the standard normal distribution always read the area to the left of Z. So in this case, okay, uh, you know that the whole area under the curve, the bell-shaped curve is probability of 1. So in this case, you want to know the shaded area. That means you do not want the tail on the right-hand side of the screen. And you also do not want the tail on the left-hand side of the screen. So you are going to deduct okay, uh, do those tail. But then, bear in mind as well that the table only reads the value to the left of Z value. So you, in this case, we have Z equals to 2.1. So you read the table, so it gives everything okay, to the left-hand side, so including the left-hand side tail. But you do not want the left-hand side tail, so you need to deduct with the probability of Z less than 91.3. Okay? So then only you get the answer is 0 0.8853. Logic which tells you that the whole area under the curve 1, so if we did that with uh, these two tail of smaller value, so probability is still large, it has to be more than 0 0.5 but less than 1. Okay, we are still continuing with uh, reading no standard normal uh, distributions table, table 3 in appendix B. Okay, let's say, okay, you are given uh, this question. What is the probability of Z greater than 3.09? Okay. So in this case, the largest value of Z given in the table is 3.09 and you read that probability of Z less than 3.09 is equals to 0.999. That means it's very close to 1. So in this case, probability of Z greater than 3.09, okay, or it's simply Z greater than 3 is basically 1, the whole area under the curve, deduct with probability of Z less than 3.09 which is given as 0 0.9999 okay so you get the answer z greater than 3.09 probability is 0 0.001 okay so in this case uh, because the table lists no values beyond 3.09 we can approximate any area beyond 3.1 as 0 so in this case probability of z greater than 3.1 so it's roughly, okay, you can consider probability of Z less than 93.1, which is equals to 0. So usually the Z value is going to be between 0 and uh, less than 3. Okay, now we are back to example 8.2. Okay, remember, you are the station manager, the new station manager. I hope you will be that one day, okay, of a petrol station on the highway. So in this case... Uh, the probability that you are looking for is the probability that you have enough stock to satisfy the demand for petrol for that day. That means before the next uh, uh, stock coming in. So you write that as probability of X less than 1,100. We convert that into the standard value. So probability of X less than 1,100 become probability of Z less than 1. And you find the answer by looking at the tables. Okay, the answer is 0.8413. In exam, okay, if you are my student in school of distance education, this is what I expect you to, to do. If uh, the question is asking you to find the probability, this is how okay, you need to jot it down and how you need to sketch and show that, oh, probability x less than 1,100 is basically the shaded area to the left-hand side of 1. So you read this as probability of Z less than 1 and the answer is 0.8413. Let's move on to another application okay, of uh, normal probability distributions. Now we are trying to apply this in finance okay, in terms of measuring risk. Okay? In section 7.4 of Keller uh, two, uh, 2009, Okay, uh, we developed an important application in finance where the emphasis was placed on reducing the variance of the return on a, uh, on a portfolio. 
We're talking about portfolio investment, one of the most important topic in finance. Okay, so in this case, we have not demonstrated why risk is measured by the variance and standard deviation. So the following example correct this deficiency. So that means we already discussed this earlier. Let's assume that. So now, okay, we are going to demonstrate, okay, why risk is measured by the variance and standard deviation. Okay, so this is uh, example 8.3. Okay, so let's say okay, uh, you are asked to consider an investment whose return is normally distributed. You must have this assumption in the uh, information given in the questions. So an investment whose return is normally distributed with a mean of 10% and a standard deviation of 5%. Okay, don't get scared with that percentage uh, symbol. It's just basically mu equals 10, sigma equals 5. Now the question is, okay, part A, determine the, prob uh, the probability of losing money. Okay, and the second part of the question is, find the probability of losing money when standard duration has changed, okay, when standard duration is equal to 10%. We are still discussing example 8.3, okay, there's a typo there. Okay, in this case, probability of losing money, okay, uh, is referring to the fact that the investment lose money when the return is negative okay the investment lose money when the return is negative so mathematically okay we wish to determine probability of x less than zero the return is negative negative means anything less than zero so the first step is for you to standardize both x and zero in the probability statement so in this case, probability x less than 0, use the z-score formula where z equals to x minus mu divided by standard duration. So in that case, x becomes z. So 0 minus 10 divided by 5. So you get negative 10 divided by 5. You get probability of z less than negative 2. We are still discussing example 8.3. So from treble 3 in the appendix B, we find that probability of losing money Okay, when the return is negative, means that probability of z less than negative 2 from the table, we read this, the probability equals to 0 0.0228. So, you, you can interpret this as the probability of losing money from that investment is 0 0.0228. It's very small probability of losing money. In the second part of the example, you are asked to increase the standard duration from the current 5 okay, to 10%. So the probability of suffering a loss now when you change standard duration from 5 to 10% has become probability of x less than 0, still the same. But now that standard duration has changed, so x becomes z. So x0 minus 10 divided by standard duration is the new standard duration, 10. So 10 divided by 10, okay, negative, so you have negative 1. So probability of z less than negative 1 Okay, the answer from the table is given as 0.1587. So you see when standard deviation has increased, okay, your, your distribution is more dispersed, okay, more scattered. Okay, so in that case, when with higher standard deviations, probability of suffering a loss has increased now into 0.1587. Okay, now we are moving on to the parts where uh, we are going to find value of z. Okay, to find some value of z for a given probability. So this, so this is the inverse of what we did earlier. Okay, so earlier, okay, you are given the proba uh, 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 value of z, find the probability. So in this case, okay, the other way around, to find some value of z, capital Z, okay, for a given probability, that means a given area under the curve. Okay, area is uh, given notation A. Okay, what is the corresponding value of small z? Okay, on the probability horizontal axis that give us this area. So uh, mathematically, we write this as probability of capital Z greater than a small z a. Okay, and then it's given equals to capital A. So that that means a is known now. Okay, what we need to know now is the small z a. Okay, if you look at the the, the graphs, okay, the diagrams. Okay, the area A in the sketch is given. Okay, so we know that this is standard Z value, uh, normal distribution table. 
So we need to find out what is the value of small z for that probability of A. Okay? We are still talking about how to find value of capital Z. Okay? So in this case, uh, what value of Z corresponds to an area under the curve, okay, which is equals to 2.5%. So 2.5% is not the value on the horizontal axis, but 2.5% is the area shaded in the uh, diagram, okay, area to the right-hand side of the small z a. So, in other words, what we are asking is that what is z with area of 0 0.025? How do I get 0 0.025? Okay, I read 2.5% percent percentages. You write that in decimal places, it becomes 0 0.025. So, in this case, Okay, since table, uh, table 3 always read area to the left hand side of the, of the shaded area. So in this case, the whole probability under the curve 1 minus the tail area that you have, okay, which is given as 0 0.025. So 1 minus 0 0.025. So you get the area to the left hand side of your sketch, which is given as 0 0.975. Okay, what you need to do now is do a reverse lookup on the table 3 for for the value of uh, area uh, under the curve okay 0 0.9750 okay so in this case you read the column and the row so you will get the corresponding za equals to 1.96 so in this case for probability of z greater than 1.96 which is equals to 0 0.025 so we say that Z for that 0 0.25, the value of Z is 1.96. Okay, other than talking about normal probability distribution, so which, uh, which is also, uh, comes under continuous probability distribution, there are other continuous uh, probability distribution. The three most important ones that will be used extensively in later section is what we call as student T distribution, chi square distribution as well as f distribution we'll discuss f distribution when we do a regression but for now we are going to discuss a little bit on student t distribution similar to uh, what we discussed in normal probability distribution okay if you look at student t distribution the letter t is used to represent the random variable just now normal distribution we use capital n for student t distribution, we use a small t, okay? So the density function for the student t distribution is given as follows, okay, uh, stated on screen. Don't get scared with those uh, mathematical statements, okay? What is most important for you now is to, uh, to know that now I'm going to introduce a new symbol, okay? It looks like v, but we pronounce as new, okay? So it looks like v, but it's actually a Greek symbol that we call new. So this is for the degree of freedom. And then we also have the gamma functions, okay, for the degree of freedoms, okay, and this is all under student T distributions. What differentiates student T distribution and normal distribution is basically uh, they are more or less the same, okay. Much like the standard normal distribution, the student T distribution is mound shape. So it looks like bell shape, but you need to differentiate a bit. It's not really like a bell, it's just like a mound, like a mountain, okay? And it's still symmetrical about its means, okay? Uh, just bear in mind, normal distribution is usually for large samples. Student T distribution is for small sample, for N less than the T. So in this case, the mean and variance of student T uh, random variable is given as uh, expected T value equals to 0 and variance of T is given as new divided by new minus 2 for all new greater than 2. So the, the graph that you need to sketch is still uh, looks like bell shape but we call that mound shape and it's still symmetrical about the means equals to 0. We are still discussing student T distribution. In much the same way that mu and sigma define normal distribution, mu, which is the degree of freedom in student t distribution, will define the student t distribution. So if you look at the diagram shown on screen, so you start with mu equals to zero, and then you have uh, the student t distribution. Okay, let's start with the first one. 
So you have student T with mu uh, nu equals to 10. Okay, that, that's the middle curve. Okay, and then you have student T with nu equals to 2, a lower value that may become flatter now. And then when you have student T with nu equals to 30, it becomes uh, a more bell-shaped curve. Okay, that means as your sample, as the number of degree of freedoms increase, the T distribution approach the standard normal distribution. Just bear in mind, okay, the curves look more or less the same. You see a bell shape is mount shape, but it's still symmetrical. The mean is still zero. Okay, this is for small sample. If you increase your sample size, okay, your T distribution, student T distribution will approach the standard normal distribution. Okay, in this part, I'm going to teach you how to determine student T values, okay, using the table given in the appendix B, table 4. Student T distribution is used extensively in statistical inference. So, other than normal distribution, you also need to know about student T distribution. So, table 4 in appendix B lists the value of T, the value that we are looking for, for area A with a degree of freedom nu. Okay, so this is how you read the values. That is value of a student T random variable with new degree of freedom is given such that probability of T greater than the T at uh, area A and with new degree of freedom is equals to A. Okay, capital A is probability that is under the curve to the right hand side in this case. So the value for A are predetermined critical value typically in the 10%, 5%, 2.5%, 1%, and half percent range. Okay, just bear in mind when we talk about later level of significance, we always talk about 5% level of significance. So if we are talking about two tail, 5% divided by two, so the area, the tail area to the right hand side of T, A with V is 2.5%. Uh, and if we are talking about level of significance 1%, so the tail area 1% divided by 2, so right hand side the tail is half percent range. Okay, here okay, we are using the T table, okay, in table 4, appendix B for determining the T value. So for example, if we want to know the value of T with 10 degree of freedom, remember degree of freedom is new, such that the area under student T is 0.05. So you must read a student T with the degree of freedom and you know what is the significance level. So in this case, the area under the curve okay, is given as 0 0.05 okay, and the degree of freedom is given as 10. So degree of freedom you read in the row. Okay, so degree of freedom you find the row there, 10. So you get, okay, and then you find the column for T, okay, 0 0.05. So T.05, uh, so you read the probability is 1.812. That is for T um, with 10 degree of freedom for the area under the curve 0 0.05. Basically, we are done with uh, continuous probability distribution. What is most important for you to know is uh, about normal probability distribution where I introduced the concept of standard normal probability distribution, the z-score formula where z is equal to x minus mu divided by standard deviation. So whatever the value of x that is given in terms of normal distribution, you must convert that into z by using the formula. And then I also introduced to you the student T distribution, which is more or less the same, okay, similar to normal distribution. It's just that it is mount shape, it's dissymmetrical, but it's for small sample. If so, if you uh, increase your sample, your student T distribution will approach the normal distribution. So now, okay, in the next part, I'm going to discuss with you a little bit about sampling distribution. Okay, why do we need to discuss sampling distribution? Because this is the underlying assumption that allow us later to make an inference in terms of estimation. So now we are in chapter 9 where we are going to discuss about sampling distribution. When we discuss sampling distribution, it's easy to discuss it in terms of examples. Okay, what do we mean by sampling distribution? Just now, okay, in the earlier chapter, I already introduced to you about the concept of sampling. And then, okay, before chapter 9, we discussed 
a normal probability distribution and student t-distribution in chapter 8. So we combine these two now, so we have the concept of sampling distribution. So suppose that we wish to examine the average weight of a batch of students in the school of distance education. Let's say we know for sure that the population of students is more than 7,000. Okay, so in this case, when you take a random sample of students, okay, whatever the size is, okay, let's say 200, maybe 50, maybe uh, 300, okay, the sample that you get may or may not be representative of the whole population. For example, if a particular sample that you took were to contain an above average population of a uh, proportion of overweight students, then you will get a high average weight, which is due to the fact that the sample have a lot of overweight students. Okay, on the other hand, if you were to pick up a sample that contain an a, uh, and a below average proportion of uh, above average proportion of underweight student. That means you are going to sample only the, the slim student, the, 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 the underweight student. So what you get is you have a lower average weight because your sample is slimmer, most of them. So in this case, you find that if you take a number of sample of student, that means you take sample number one, 200, then you take another sample, another 200, and then you take another sample of 200, okay, you would expect that the sample mean x bar for the first one, x bar for the second sample, x bar for the third group of sample, they will vary from sample to sample. Why? Simply because some sample may contain a high proportion of overweight student, whereas other sample may contain a high proportion of underweight student. So in this case, you have all these different sample of student that you take okay, uh, uh, into your consideration. So we say that in general that the sample mean has a sampling distribution because we have different uh, x bar from the first sample, okay, x bar 2 from the sec uh, second sample, x bar 3 from the third sample and so on and so on. Okay, so the sample mean also has a sampling distribution. So if a population has a mean, mu, and a standard deviation sigma, then it is possible to show that in general, the number in the sample, which is n, the sample mean, x bar, has a normal distribution with mean equals to mu, and standard deviation now is given as sigma divided by square root of n. Okay, so this is now known as standard error. So this is what we call as sampling distribution. I'm going to introduce to you the concept of central limit theorem. Okay, the sampling distribution of the mean of a random sample drawn from any population okay, is approximately normal for a su sufficiently large sample size. So in this case, what you see is that the larger the sample size, the more closely the sampling distribution of x will resemble a normal distribution. So in this case, bear in mind when we talk about data collection, when you do sampling, you have to balance this need. Okay, if you are if you are taking too small sample, so uh, okay, you will have problem. Okay, it won't be uh, resembling normal distribution. So you would prefer to increase your sample size. But when you increase your sample size, it, you will increase your cost. So you have to balance those needs. It's also possible to show that under sampling distributions, when your sample is large, x bar, which refer to the sample means, will follow a normal distribution. So you find that 97.4% uh, of observation are within two standard deviation of the mean. So remember last time when I introduced um, 5% level is significant, 5% is referring to the tail okay, area, so you deduct 5% divided by 2, so basically you have uh, 100 minus 2.5%, so that's how you get 97.4, okay, so that means it's within the two standard deviations of the main, and we are talking about 1% level of significance, okay, so 1% divided by 2 is 0 uh, 0.05 tails, okay, so we are talking about 99% of the observation are within three standard deviations of the mean. So you have to play around with this figure in your memory, okay? Uh, keep that in your memory, so basically it's, uh, uh, we'll come across this again and again. Okay, we are done now with uh, the third part of uh, part two where we discuss sampling distributions. 
So now I'm going to move on to chapter 10 where we are going to discuss estimation. So this is part of inferential statistics. After you gather your data, after you describe your data, now you are going to make an inference. In chapter 10, we are going to talk about introduction to estimation. What does estimation is all about? Uh, do recall that in chapter 8, okay, where we discuss normal probability distributions, so normal distributions allow us to make probability statement about x. What is x? x is your random variable, whatever that we are talking about, which is a member of the population. So to do so, we need the population parameter. So for normal probability distribution, parameter is mu and sigma. Okay, uh, in chapter 9, okay, a bit of uh, recap, okay, in case you've been lost, okay, in our discussion. Okay, so far, okay, in chapter 9, we know that sampling distributions allow us to make probability statements about statistics. So we need the population parameter. If we, are di if we are discussing sample mean, that means you need the population parameter in terms of mu and sigma. And then if we are discussing sample proportion, then you need to have population parameter in terms of P, proportion. And if we are talking about difference between sample mean, so we have mu1 and sigma1 okay, for one sample, and then mu2 and sigma2 for the second sample, and so on and so forth. However, in almost all realistic situations, parameters are unknown. So we will use the sampling distributions to draw inferences about the unknown population's parameter. Uh, so we are now back to statistical inference. So remember, in estimation, we are going to do inference. Okay, inferential statistic. What is it? So inferential statistic is the process by which we acquire information and make conclusion about population from sample statistic. Okay, so you have population where you sample, take your sample, okay, uh, into all your data, and you're going to use statistical tools, okay, so that from the sample statistic you can gain information. So in order to do inference, we require the skills and knowledge of what we did in part one, okay, especially about mean and standard deviations. What we did today, okay, uh, in earlier part where we discussed probability distribution, especially normal distribution as well as sampling distribution in chapter 9. When we talk about estimation, basically there are two types of inference, okay? Uh, estimation and hypothesis, uh, hypothesis testing. Estimation is the part that I'm going to do today, okay? The objective of estimation from the word estimate, okay? Is to determine the approximate value of a population parameter based on the base uh, on uh, based on the value of sample statistic. So from sample statistic that you have gathered, you are going to approximate what is the value of population parameter. So in this case, the example is the sample mean x bar is employed to estimate the population mean mu. Use x bar to estimate what is the value of mu. To give you an uh, overall idea what we are doing about estimations, okay? So let's look at this one, okay, where the objective of estimation is to determine the approximate value of a population parameter on the basis of sample statistics. Basically, there are two types of estimator. The first one is what we call as point estimate. That means you just have that uh, yellow dot there, okay, so that is that you, the point that you are going to estimate. Okay, knowing that, you know, when you do estimation, there are probability that you might estimate wrongly, okay. So that means if you do point estimate, what if you estimate to the right? So it's considered as wrong estimation. What if you estimate to the left? So that is the wrong estimation as well. So perhaps what is better for you to do is to have an interval estimation. So you're going to range, okay, you're going to find a range of value for your estimator. So we call that interval estimator. What is an interval estimator? So an interval estimator draw inferences about a population by estimating the value of an unknown parameter using an interval. So in this case, okay, we can say that with a certain percentage of certainty that the population parameter of interest is between some lower and upper bounds or some lower and upper limits. Let's look at the difference between point and interval estimation. 
So in the example here, suppose that we want to estimate the mean summer income of a class of business student. Okay, so in this case for sample size n equals to 25 students, x bar is calculated to be $400 per week. Okay, so in this case, uh, $400 per week, okay, x bar, so that is your point estimate. As for an interval estimate, okay, let's say you have an alternative statement, the mean income is between 380 and 420 per week. So basically, that's the difference in terms of what you say in terms of point estimation and what you say in terms of interval estimation. So you have a lower bound and upper bound. So not just one value as in point estimator. Uh, in discussing inferential statistics, especially when we discuss about estimation, okay, there are a few desirable qualities of an estimator. Okay, the first one okay, and foremost is that you, have, you must have an unbiased estimator. So an unbiased estimator or population parameter is an estimator whose expected value is equal to that parameter. So you want to be as uh, truthful as possible, okay, not biased. And in this case, the second characteristic or the second quality is that consistency. So an unbiased estimator is said to be consistent if the difference between the estimator and the parameter grows smaller as the sample size grow larger. So again, okay, the sampling part, okay, in terms of your sample size, okay, determine, okay, the quality of the estimator. In this case, what we want is, okay, consistent estimator where the difference between the estimator and the parameter grows smaller as the sample size grows larger. So it becomes more accurate. And the third quality is that if there are two unbiased estimators of parameter, the one whose uh, variance is smaller is said to be relatively efficient. Okay, so bear in mind, okay, in part one when we discuss about measure of dispersion, Okay, what is variant? Okay, we want to measure how your data is dispersed. So in this case, when we talk about variance is small, so your estimator is relatively efficient. Okay, let's look at the three qualities of an uh, estimator just now. So the first one, when we discuss unbiased estimator, an unbiased estimator of a population parameter is an estimator whose expected value is equals to parameter to that parameter. So in this case, the, the sample mean x bar is an unbiased estimator of the population mean mu if the expected value of x is equals to mu. Okay, that's how we write it mathematically. When we discuss the second quality of uh, estimator, okay, when it comes to consistency, okay. An unbiased estimator is said to be consistent if the difference between the estimator and the parameter grows smaller as the uh, sample size grows larger. So example is given as x is a consistent estimator of mu because variant of x, okay, in mathematics, okay, symbol, is sigma squared divided by n. That means as n grows larger, the numerator, the variance of x grows smaller. When it comes to the third quality of a good estimator, okay, this is where we discuss relative efficiency. If there are two unbiased estimators of a parameter, the one whose variance is smaller is said to be relatively efficient. So in this case, okay, uh, the example is given here. Both the sample median and sample mean are an unbiased estimator of the population mean. However, the sample median has greater variance than the sample mean. So in this case, we choose X bar since it is relatively efficient when compared to the sample median. So the sample mean X bar is the best estimator of a population mean mu. Okay, now what we are going to do is to estimate mu when sigma is known. So remember how we are going to estimate mu? We are going to use the sample statistic sample mean X bar. Okay, so in chapter 8, we produce the following general probability statement about X bar. Okay, and from chapter 9, okay, the sampling pro uh, distribution of X bar is approximately normal with a mean mu and standard deviation is given as sigma divided by square root of n. So that part of sampling distribution, 
Standard deviation or sampling deviation sigma divided by square root of n is what is known as standard error. So in this case, we are going to estimate the probability of z between an upper limit, z alpha divided by 2, as well as z uh, at the lower limit, negative alpha divided by 2. And this is equals to 1 minus alpha. So we are going to go back to the z-score formula. Okay, z or z is equals to x bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of n. Okay, remember what is x bar? x bar is the uh, sample mean. Okay, what is mu? Mu is population mean. What is sigma divided by square root of n? That is standard duration for the sampling distribution. So the z score is approximately normally distributed. So it's, uh, you have to differentiate the z score formula in normal distribution x minus mean of mu divided by sigma. But when we are doing estimation, we are going to take x bar instead of x, deduct with mu divided by sigma divided by square root of n. So it's just a variation of the same formula. So when we are estimating mu when sigma is known, what we are going to do is to substitute z such that we produce the following statement as you can see on the screen. Okay, the first uh, box, okay, we are estimating the value of z sigma divided by 2. Okay, the upper limit is positive, the lower limit is negative. Okay, we put z in the middle, x bar minus mu divided by sigma divided by square root of n. So the probability is given as 1 minus alpha. Okay, so in chapter 9, okay, I'm going to introduce a little bit of algebra here. We express the following probability of mean minus z alpha divided by 2, okay, sigma divided by square root of n. Okay, so mean will be, uh, x bar will be between this value, the uh, lower bound, and the upper bound, the same formula as in the left-hand side, you have uh, mu plus z alpha divided by 2, sigma divided by square root of m. So this is the probability, okay, 1 minus alpha. And we uh, change a little bit, okay, into our algebra. So what we have is, okay, mu, Okay, the estimated uh, value that we are looking for, mu, will be in terms of x bar plus or minus z alpha divided by 2. Okay, whatever the value of z for alpha divided by 2. And then multiply with sigma divided by square root of n. This is the standard error for the sampling distribution. So this is the uh, most important formula that you need to remember. It's just a variation of the formula that we introduced before in terms of z-score. And then we introduced the standard error for sampling distribution. And then you have the plus sign for the upper limit and the minus sign for the lower limit. Okay, so when we estimate mu when sigma is known, this is the formula that we are using. Probability of mu is given as x bar plus or minus z sigma divided by 2. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, not sigma, okay? Uh, is, mu is given as x bar plus or minus z alpha divided by 2 multiplied with sigma divided by square root of n. So this is still a probability statement about x bar. However, the statement is also a confident interval estimator of mu. So this is the formula for you to estimate mu using the value of x bar. Okay, so the interval for estimation for mu now can be expressed as, okay, the first box is what we call as the lower confidence limit. Okay, later on I'm going to use short form LCL, lower confidence limit. Okay, so this is where x bar minus z alpha divided by 2 multiplied with sigma divided square root of m. Okay, the same formula, okay, except that now you introduce plus sign will be the upper confidence limit, UCL. Okay, x bar plus z alpha divided by 2, sigma divided by square root of n. The probability of 1 minus alpha, the confidence level, which is a measure of how frequent the interval will actually include mu. In order to improve your understanding on these estimation things, okay, we are going to discuss it in the context of example. So let's look at example 10.1. So what we have here is that 
Uh, we have the Dell Computer Company, basically referring to Dell, but of course there is a uh, trademark okay, uh, that you need to consider. So the Dell Computer Company makes its own computers and delivers them directly to customers who order them via the internet. To achieve its objective of speed, Dell makes each of its five most popular computers and transports them to warehouses from which it generally takes one day to deliver a computer to the customer. So this strategy requires high levels of inventory that add considerably to the cost. So, so we are still discussing example 10.1. So to lower this cost, the operation manager wants to use an inventory model. So he notes that he here can be you or me. He notes that demand during lead time is normally distributed. This is very important, this statement. Demand during lead time is normally distributed and he needs to know the mean to compute the optimum inventory level. So you are asked to estimate uh, the optimum inventory level. It's like, you know, the optimum stocks. So he observed that, uh, he observed for 25 lead time period and record the demand during each period. The data set is given, okay, you can find it, okay, in the books, okay, it's the CD-ROM. Okay, so the manager would like a 95% confident interval estimate of the mean demand during lead time. Okay, so you have the word normally distributed. So now you are asked to make a 95% confidence interval estimate of the mean demand during lead time. The question is asking you, what is the mean demand during lead time? So let's assume that the managers know that the standard duration is 75 computers. So you have, okay, N equals to 25 and you have standard duration is 75. What is shown on screen here is the data for the mean lead time, for example, 10.1. So the first step that you need to do is to identify what does the questions want you to do. In this case, since we are discussing a uh, chapter uh, 9, uh, chapter 10 in terms of estimation so you know that oh this is asking you to estimate but in exam you do not know perhaps okay what does the question wants you to do so in this case if you have the word okay estimate the mean demand over lead time okay with a 95% confidence so the word 95% 95 conf 95 confidence or sometimes they change to 99% confidence so it tells you that Oh, I need to do estimation. So in this case, use the formula. What is the formula to estimate mu? Mu is given uh, to equals to x bar plus or minus z alpha divided by 2. Okay, multiply with sigma divided by square root of n. So thus, the parameter that need to be estimated is the population mean, which is mu. So our confidence interval estimator will be... Okay, we still haven't answered what is our uh, confidence interval estimator. So the second step uh, in order for you to answer that is to compute. Okay, in example 10.1, okay, in order to use our confidence interval estimator, we need the following pieces of data. So you have X bar, okay, 370.16. How do you get the X bar? You add up the raw data that is shown on screen just now and you divide by the number of N. Okay, and you have Z alpha divided by 2. Okay, how do you get this? Okay, so remember, okay, alpha is the tail area. So in this case, when we talk about 5% confidence interval or confidence limit. So 5% because it's two tail because, you know, uh, upper limit and lower limit. So you have tail on the right hand side, tail on the left hand side. So in that case, 5% divided by 2. So in this case, okay, you need to find the area under the curve, okay, such that the tail on the right hand side is 2.5% or 0 0.025. So you read what is the value of Z at the horizontal axis. So it's supposed to be 1.96. Okay, this is back to the uh, table for normal standard normal distribution. As a rule of thumb, you just need to remember when we discuss Okay, 95% confident interval, the Z alpha divided by 2 will be 1.96.
if you this uh, if you are asked to calculate 99 percent confidence interval so the z alpha divided by 2 that means 1 percent divided by 2 the tail so the value will be 2.58 okay just remember that z alpha divided by 2 for 95 percent is 1.96 Z alpha divided by 2 for 99% confident interval is 2.58. Other information from the information uh, given in the data, okay, in the question is that sigma is equal to 75 and equals to 25. So you have that from the question. What you need to do now is slot all the information into the formula. Okay, so you have X bar equals to 370.16. Plus minus Z alpha divided by 2 is equals to 1.96. Sigma is equals to 25. Okay, square root of N is square root of 5. So you need to solve the right hand side of the plus minus first. So you have square root of 25 is 5. <clears throat> and then you have 75 divided by 5. So you get like uh, 15. Okay, so 15 multiplied with 1.96. So, you get plus minus 21.40. So, the estimated value for mu is 370.16 plus or minus 21, uh, 29.40. If you have a larger data set, okay, uh, you can use computer. Okay, using Excel for you to compute using data analysis plus tool set that come with the CD-ROM that is uh, together with the textbook. Okay, I'm going to skip this for now. I just want to show with you, okay, if you use the data analysis tools, okay, in uh, Excel, okay, this is the result that is going to be produced by the analysis. So, Z estimate, Z referring to normal distribution, okay, for mean. So, you have the mu, okay, is given in terms of lead demand time, 370.16, standard duration is, uh, for the sample is 80.75. Observation N is 25, Sigma is the uh, standard duration for the population, which is 75. So the lower uh, confidence limit, okay, 370 plus, uh, minus, okay, the, the right hand side of the formula just now, you get 340. And the upper confidence limit is 370 plus the right hand side of the formula, you get 399.56. So this is the two value that you need to produce when it comes to what is the the ninety five percent confident estimate for the value of mu. It has to be three four zero point seven six to three nine nine point five six. So it's a it's an interval. So it's not enough for you to simply compute okay the the figure. What you need to do next is to interpret okay what's the meaning of what you calculate. So in example 10.1, the estimation for the mean demand during lead time okay, lies between 340.76 and 399.56. So you can use this as an input in developing an inventory policy if you are the manager of that doll uh, company. So that is, we estimate that the mean demand during lead time will fall between 340.76 and 399.56. And this type of estimator, we are confident it is correct 95% of the time. That also means that 5% of the time, the estimator will be incorrect. So that's the meaning of 95% confidence interval. Okay, incidentally, the media often refers to the 95% figure as 19 times out of 20, which emphasizes the long run aspect of the confidence interval levels okay when it comes to interpreting the confidence interval okay you need to pay close attention okay not only to the calculation but also to the interpretations of what you estimate so in this case some people erroneously interpret the confidence interval estimate in example 10.1 to mean that there is a 95 percent probability that the population means lies between three for 340.76 and 399.56 this this interpretation is wrong because it implies that the population mean is a variable about which we can make a probability statement in fact the population mean is a fixed but unknown quantity 
Consequently, we cannot interpret the confident in love, uh, interval estimate of mu as a probability statement about mu. When it comes to interpreting the confident interval estimator, so to translate the confident interval estimates properly, we must remember that the confident interval estimator was derived from the sampling distribution of the sample mean. That's why I already explained to you in chapter 9 what is sampling distributions. So in this case, we use the sampling distributions to make probability statement about the sample mean. Although the form has changed, the confident interval estimator is also a probability statement about the sample mean, not about the population's mean. We are still discussing about interpretation of the confident interval estimator. So here it states that there is one minus alpha probability that the sample mean will be equal to a value such that the interval, so you have the lower confidence limit, okay, x bar minus z alpha divided by 2 sigma by uh, divided by square root of n, up to the upper confidence limit x bar plus z alpha divided by 2 sigma by the uh, divided by square root of n which will include the population mean. Once the sample means is computed, the interval acts as the lower and upper limits of the interval estimate of the population's mean. Let's estimate this okay, in an illustration. Suppose that we want to estimate the mean value of the distribution resulting from the, the fair uh, throw of a uh, fair die. Okay, so in this case, because we know the distributions, we also know that mu equals to 3.5 and sigma is equal to 171. Okay, you put it in the formula. So let's pretend now that we know only that sigma equals to 1.71, that mu is unknown and that we want to estimate its value. So to estimate, what we need to do is draw a sample of size n equals to 100 and calculate the confident interval estimator. As for the 90% confident in, uh, interval estimator, the same formula, except that now, okay, z alpha divided by 2 is re replaced by, instead of 1.96, now you have 1.645. How do you get this value? So remember when we talk about 90% confident interval, so you have the balance 10% for the tails. You have two tails, so 10% divided by 2 is 5%. So 5% on the right-hand side of the uh, Z uh, uh, bell-shaped normal curve and another 5% at the left-hand side of the bell-shaped normal curve. So if you are looking for the area to the left-hand side of the, the right-hand side tail, so that is area for 0 0.95 or 95%. So in that case, for 95%, okay, the area to the left, so what is the value on the horizontal axis for Z? You get 1.645. Where do you get this? from table 3 in uh, the appendix B for standard normal distribution. So in this case, so you have okay uh, the 90% confident interval that will give you Z alpha divided by 2 which is equals to 1.645. You know that sigma is 1.71, put it in the formula as well as uh, sample size equals 200. So you solve the right hand side of the formula okay uh, on the right hand side of the plus or minus. So you get 1.71 divided by square root of 100. So actually it's 1.71 divided by 10. Okay, and then the answer you multiply with 1.645. So you should get 0.281. What does it mean actually, what we did just now? So this notation means that if we repeatedly draw sample of size 100 from this population, 90% of the value of x bar will be such that mu would lie somewhere between x bar plus 0.281 and x bar minus 2.81. And that 10% of the value of x bar will produce interval that would not include mu. So now imagine that we draw 40 samples of 100 observation each. The value and the resulting confident interval estimate are shown in table 10.2. Okay, now let's talk about interval width. Okay, so a wide interval provide little information. Okay, that means because when you want to do estimate, you want to estimate as correct as possible. So if you are giving a large uh, range of value, a wide interval, so it doesn't make sense. 
So for example, suppose we estimate with 95% confidence level that an accountant average starting salary is between $15,000 and $100,000. Okay, what does it mean then? Because $15,000 and $100,000 is a big uh, in, uh, range there, a wide interval. So compare that statement when we dos, uh, discuss a 95% confidence interval estimate of starting salary of an accountant which uh, between $42,000 and $45,000 which as estimate that you would trust more so in this case the second estimate is much narrower providing accounting student more precise information about setting salaries so if you are a man manager of a company if you are owner of a business okay you need to have uh, the second type of estimation with a smaller interval okay not a wide interval in order for you to play with the uh, interval width okay we need to refer back to the formula so in this case the width of the confidence interval estimate is a function of the confidence level remember because z uh, the value of z at alpha divided by 2 so whether we're talking about 10% okay uh five percent or one percent and then remember you need to divide by two because two tails okay so in this case uh uh the interval width is also affected by the population standard deviation sigma as well as the sample size so these three item confidence level okay alpha uh population standard deviation sigma and sample size n will all affect your de de determination of the interval width so if you look at the graph that is shown on screen okay in terms of the interval width so we already discussed the fact that the width of the confidence interval estimate is a function of the confidence level the function of the population standard duration as well as the sample size so a larger confidence interval will produce a wider confidence interval so i already shown earlier in the example it's better to have a 95 percent confidence limit instead of 90% confidence limit all right so it's shown on there on the screen similarly when we discuss about uh, population standard deviation sigma so we find that a larger value of sigma will produce a wider confidence interval bear in mind when we discuss sigma or population standard deviation that is the spread of your graph of your uh, normal distribution curve so in this case if it's spread wider so that means your uh, interval estimation is also wider in this case what we want is to have a smaller standard duration such that your uh, confidence interval estimation will be re uh, smaller in width as well and the third factor that affect the interval width is uh, where we discuss the sample size so in this case okay the sample size is the uh, denumerator okay so increasing the sample size will decrease the width of the confidence interval while the confidence level can remain unchanged okay so remember but uh, at the same time you have to bear in mind when you increase the sample size you are also increasing the cost of obtaining additional data so you might want to increase your sample size because you want to make your uh, confidence interval estimator uh, becoming better but you are also incurring a cost of uh, obtaining additional data when we talk about selection of the sample size i already discussed with you earlier in chapter 5 where we point out that sampling error is the difference between an estimator and a parameter we can also define this difference as the error of estimation so in this chapter this can be expressed as the difference between x bar and mu so how do we select the sample size so let's look at the formula the bound on the error of estimation is give, given as z alpha divided by 2 okay multiply with sigma divided by the square root of n bear in mind this is also uh, the sam uh, the standard error for the sampling distribution okay so b equals to z alpha divided by 2 multiply with sigma divided by square root of m so let's rearrange this formula okay so brings okay square root of n okay to the left hand side brings b down okay so uh square root of m bring it to the left hand side okay and then because it's square root you need to take the square so that it become n 
Okay, so when you take the square on the left hand side, so everything on the right hand side, you also have to square. So Z alpha divided by 2 multiplied with sigma, divided by B, because we bring down B from the left hand side, so everything now is square. So with a little algebra, we find the sample size to estimate a mean. So this is about the formula to select the sample size. Okay, what is N? Okay, you use this Z alpha divided by 2, multiply with sigma, divide by the uh, bound error of the estimation. Okay, and then you take the square root. Okay, let's show this selection of sample size using example. Okay, to illustrate this, suppose that in example 10.1 before, okay, uh, before you gather the data, the manager has decided that he needed to estimate the mean demand of lead time okay during lead time to within 16 unit okay which is the bound on the error of estimation okay so you also have 95 percent confident interval so one minus alpha that means uh you have the uh, 0.95 and sigma equals to 75 so you replace this okay into the formula that i discussed just now so you have z alpha divided by 2 for 95 percent confident interval just remember Okay, the critical value that of Z is 1.96. If we are talking about 99% confident interval, just remember the critical value of Z alpha divided by 2 is 2.58. And then you have just now, for 90% confident interval, okay, the critical value of Z alpha divided by 2 is 1.645. But we suddenly ask that one. Okay, so back to the formula. 1.96 multiply with sigma, okay, 75. Okay, divide by the bound on the error of estimation, which is determined, okay, from the questions. Okay, everything, okay, uh, you take the square, so you should get 84.45. So that is this, the minimum sample size that you need to do to make sure that, you know, uh, the, the, the limit of the error that you, you do when it comes to your estimation. We are still discussing about select, uh, selection of the sample size in the earlier example. Because n must be an integer, and because we want the bound on the error of estimation to be no more than 16, so any non-integer value must be round up. So just now our answer is 84 point something something. Thus, the value of your sample size, the value of your n is rounded to 85, rounded up. Which means that 95%, okay, to be 95% confident that the error of estimation will be no larger than 16, we need to randomly sample 85 lead time interval. Okay, so that's the meaning of what we did just now. So basically, we have come to the end of part 2. Okay, I hope, okay, uh, together with me, we have achieved the objective. Okay, from chapter 5, you know about the different method of data collections, how to do survey, how you do sampling and then in chapter 8 okay i introduce to you okay the difference between continuous and discrete probability distribution and the most important probability distribution that you need to know is the normal probability distribution from normal probability distribution then we move on to the standard normal uh, table where with the use of z score formula where z equals to x minus mu divided by sigma and then I introduce to you, okay, in chapter 9, the concept of sampling distribution. And just now, we, did, we, we make the first inferential statistic in terms of estimation, either at 95% confident interval or 99% confidence interval. Okay, at the same time, other than estimate the interval, you also need to determine the sample size. So there is a play around the formula of confident interval estimation. Okay, to wrap up uh, our session for today, okay, when it comes to part 2, don't forget to try the exercise at the end of each chapter. And for those students of School of Distant Education, USM, please check out the e-learning portal from time to time. And I would like to add two quotes here, okay, by uh, Aaron Levinstein. Okay, statistics are like bikinis. Okay, I do hope that you can imagine what bikinis look like. So what they reveal is suggestive, but what they conceal is vital. So that's the, uh, your job as a statistician now, okay, not just to compute, but to actually interpret what you compute. 
And another quote that I would like to share is that facts are stubborn things, but statistics are more pliable. That means depends. Okay, you can play around with the size of your sample. You can play around whether you are, you would like to be ninety five percent confident or would you like to be ninety nine percent confidence. Okay, so these are the things that you can play around. So it's more pliable statistic. Okay, so with that, okay, we have come to the end of part two. So I hope to see you, okay, in the the next part. So in the meantime, okay, don't forget to try the exercises. Okay, all the best.